Remember, when we left off, we had introduced the skeleton, our divisions of the skeleton. We took a look at how bone tissue is made, being the constituent tissue of the skeleton. Now, we're starting to put it together. The job of the skeleton was, one, for support, but it also allowed movement in conjunction with the, uh, the muscular system. And that movement occurs at joints. So today we're talking about joints, Thursday we're talking about muscle, how muscle works with and articulates the skeleton at joints. So for this lecture, or this, uh, this section, we're going to... Uh, you guys hear feedback? No, that's okay. We're going to identify various types of joints in the body. So like the nervous system, we classified the nervous system into structural and functional roles. Joints are very similar. We're going to talk about the structural and functional classifications of these different types of joints. You don't know what a fibrous joint is yet, or a cartilaginous joint, or a synovial joint, but you will. We'll talk about the movements that can occur at joints. Structure dictates function. Here, it's plain to see. It happens um, everywhere in the body, but it's a really easy example to look at joints. The structure of joints will dictate their function. We'll take a look at how the uh, range of motion and movement is affected. And we'll look at a couple candidate joints, knee joint, shoulder joint, elbow joint, wrist joint, things like that and uh, identify the uh, specific details for each one uh, as we move through the body. But a lot of the discussion on, on joints, bones, muscles will be in their respective sections as we move through the body. These are examples. Now this was way more topical last year around this time. What is a joint? A point of contact or articulation is used more commonly. Less commonly, it's, it's called a point of arthrosis, but arthrosis describes movement. It's a point of contact between two or more bones most commonly. Usually it's two. Sometimes there's three, and we'll see examples of that at the end of the section. Two or more bones, that's what we think of classically when we imagine a joint. It can also be the point of contact between cartilage and bone. It might not be commonly what you think of as a joint, or between teeth and bone. Where your teeth sit in your jaw is a joint as well. It's a point of contact between two different structures. Uh, and generally, this covers all of the possible combinations. Cartilage and bone. Cartilage can come in many different forms. Uh, uh, two different bones together with their articular capsules, teeth and bone, that covers the full gambit, and we'll look at how each of those presents when we classify the joints. Now, this is our quest to understand things, our desire to classify things. We can list joints structurally or functionally, a lot like the nervous system, structural and functional. And the questions to ask when you're trying to figure out which joint is which is, number one, is there a synovial uh, capsule? And I kind of gave that away because one type of joint has a synovial capsule and others don't. Think of it as a joint cavity, a joint capsule, a ball that wraps around the point of contact between two bones. If there is a capsule, it's one kind of joint, it's easy to identify. And spoiler is, it's a synovial joint. We'll look at that coming up. What kind of connective tissue is there? What kind of connective tissue is there? Is it cartilage? Is it fibrocartilage? Is it uh, connective tissue? And depending on the answers to those questions, we can classify them broadly as fibrous joints from, uh, from least movable to most movable, cartilaginous, and then synovial at the most movable end. Those are our three main structural definitions. Functionally, the amount of movement allowed at the joints will parallel the structure. 
So it's not that these ever really diverge. You don't have to worry about too many different combinations like with uh, epithelial cells, for instance. The degree of movement generally matches the structure at the joint. Okay. Structure dictates function here. The names for these movements are somewhat complicated. They're all arthroses, which is why I introduced that term on the last slide. But the least movable on the left are synarthroses. Moderately movable are amphiarthroses. And then the most movable joints, my arm flailing at you, is the action of diarthroses, diarthrotic joints. The most, uh, most movable. Usually, if you take these lists, you can match them up one to one. Fibrous joints are usually synanthrotic. Synovial joints are usually diathrotic. So the lists match up top to bottom. Let's take a look at each kind of joint. What do I mean when I say fibrous joint? A couple examples are shown in this uh, figure on the right-hand side. The first question, is there a joint capsule or a cavity? The answer is no. They lack a synovial cavity, so they're not synovial joints. And these are uh, points of articulation between two bones, two or more bones, that are connected with dense fibrous tissue. They're knitted together. Fibrous joints. You can think of them as being knitted together, and therefore they permit essentially no movement. Maybe there's a flex or a slight wiggle, but they permit little or no movement. And the types that we'll look at in a bit more detail on the next slide, the first and foremost is a suture. Sutures are obvious in the skull or the cranium. You can see the dense fibrous cartilage that um, intervenes between the three bones in that top image. Hardly any movement there. And then syndesmoses is a fancy word for joints that are created by um, connective tissue. So where the clavicle meets the shoulder blade, there is a joint between those two bones that's only made up of connective tissue. Ligaments connecting two bones are an example of a syndesmosis. And one of the, uh, the easiest examples that I'm not showing you here that we'll see a picture of on the next slide is uh, an interosseous membrane, a really long ligament, or sorry, tendon, that spans between two bones, a membrane between two bones, interosseous membrane. I'll show you that coming up on the next slide. And there's another type down here, a gomphosis, but I'm not going to ask you about that, so don't worry about it. It's a special kind of joint reserved only for the teeth. So let's look quickly at a suture. Sutures are nearly immovable in you or I as full-grown adults, but they might have some movability or flexibility in children. They are somewhat movable as the plates of the skull fuse together. And they generally will fuse in this rivulet pattern. So this winding back and forth, this knitted together pattern, where in a live person, the, uh, the space between these two bones would be full with that dense connective tissue. If the shape isn't enough to lock them in place, the connective tissue should, uh, certainly would be. So you can see the sutures are... They share this characteristic shape that no other joint in the body will share. Really easy to distinguish a suture. Most views in adulthood generally making all of these individual plates of the cranium solid. You can consider them one continuous uh, bone or structure. So that's the first example of a fibrous joint. And then the second, the syndesmosis, the... Uh, tendons that connect two bones. You can see a couple of them shown here. This is the tibia and the fibula, or the lower leg. Uh, 
the bones of the lower leg. Between those two bones, you'll notice this sheet that runs all the way down. This is an interosseous membrane, a membrane between two bones, as the name would imply. There's only that membrane between two bones. There's no muscles in the way. It is still a joint characterized by that sheet. And you'll also notice another smaller one down here at the end, another uh, tendon between the two bones. We'll get into the details of that when we get to that section. But these are largely immovable. Maybe there's some flex, but largely these joints are relatively static. They limit the range of motion. There's hardly any ability to move these bones in relation to one another. Certainly the suture, not movable. Even the uh, bones of the lower leg, not very movable. So fibrous joints, no capsule, dense connective tissue, immovable. How do those differ from cartilaginous joints? They share a lot of the similar structures. Cartilaginous is just a bit looser. Whatever it is that connects them is, uh, it can be a bit jelly-like. It's different kinds of cartilage that connect it. So is there a synovial cavity? Is there a joint capsule? No. Again, these don't have a capsule. The bones that articulate are connected by cartilage, hyaline cartilage, and other fibrocartilage. Together, the structure might be a little bit softer. Not soft, but a little bit softer than the uh, dense, irregular connective tissue that holds together sutures. And you can see some examples in the image on the right-hand side. These are structures that we'll look at again on the next slide, but you can imagine them being slightly movable, flexible, right? Certainly your spine can flex and move around. It's not static. They do um, allow some movement, a little bit of movement. Each individual joint allows some small movement. The reason why your spine seems to be so flexible is that many of these joints together these small bits of movement add up to allow a fair degree of motion. There's really only one kind of cartilaginous joint, but we separate them based on their location. So the synchondroses are not on the midline. These are somewhat rubbery, somewhat flexible cartilaginous joints. The name for these joints when they appear to the uh, lateral aspect of the midline is a synchondrosis. And the special name for the joints that lie on the midline is a symphysis. Otherwise, they are the same. The name just tells you where they are. So the pubic symphysis lies right on the midline here between two pubic bones. The joints between your vertebrae are symphyses as well. They're on the midline. But the joints that connect the ribs to the sternum, they're just lateral to the midline. Even though they're a very similar uh, type and structure of joint, they're called synchondroses because they're off to the side. You'll also see on here a starred or an asterisked uh, cartilaginous joint, which is arguably not a joint that we just finished talking about in the last section, the epiphyseal cartilages. And we'll look at that in detail on the next slide and try to argue for or against why it might be considered a cartilaginous joint. So let's take a look at each of these just briefly. So the joints between ribs and the sternum, somewhat movable. You can press on them. It's generally difficult to uh, manipulate them, to move them, but they must move because with every breath, your ribs lift up and then fall back down again. There's some movement. They're generally pretty static. 
mostly due to the hyaline cartilage that allows some flexibility between the ribs and the sternum. It's the only reason that the thoracic cage can open up and inflate and air can move into your lungs. These are slightly movable. The uh, symphyses, the pubic symphysis and the vertebral discs are similar in these special cases, the outside material is the same kind of cartilage as you would find at the, uh, the ribs connecting to the sternum, but they're designed in such a way because their purpose is so special that the inside contains some fluid. They're like cushioned hockey pucks. And that allows them to flex and extend with a little bit more maneuverability because the inside has some fluid that's uh, contained and allows for cushioning. So again, hyaline cartilage, there's a fibro uh, or fibrous cartilage outside that makes sure that the disc holds together and doesn't rupture. It contains some fluid that allows a cushioning uh, nature of these symphyses. And then lastly on this example, the epiphyseal cartilage which I'm including here because there is movement. There's some small degree of movement, which we've defined these cartilaginous joints as allowing, but it's not between two bones. This is within one bone. And we just talked at length before the break about the process by which bones grow. You can see the epiphyseal plates here in a femur. This is slightly different than the, uh, the example we, we looked at. There are two plates because the femur grows in two directions. Notice the diaphysis in the middle, but there are two epiphyses on one end. There's movement here as the bone grows, but it's within one bone, so it's arguably a cartilaginous joint, some movement but it's arguably not a cartilaginous joint because it's within one bone. It's not an articulation. So I won't ask you to tell me if they are or are not a joint because you can argue it either way. Um, I'm leaning towards the not a joint since it's within one bone and it doesn't match what our definition of a joint is. And you'll remember if we zoom in, if I threw this up here, you'd be able to tell me what the uh, zoning rest, uh, zone of resting cartilage was, and the zone of proliferating cartilage, hypertrophic cartilage, calcified cartilage, right? You could remember what all those stages were in the, uh, the growth in length of a long bone. Probably. Maybe you'll need that for midterm too, who knows? If you're looking at this slide, you're, you're probably looking at it and thinking, okay, well, it looks like the zone of resting cartilage is at number one, if I'm listing them in order. Those chondrocytes are really small. And then the stacked coins of the proliferating cartilage are at number two. Those grow in size at number three, hypertrophic cartilage, calcified cartilage, and then ossified or bone tissue, number five. Free free cap. Any questions about that? That shouldn't be anything new. Unless, did we cover that on Friday when half of you were gone? Maybe we did. Maybe go back and review that lecture. Synovial joint, finally, a familiar joint. This is what you think of when you think of joints, joints in the body. Two bones articulating, maybe three. They're covered with an articular cartilage. These ones have a joint capsule. That capsule is sealed. It connects the two bones that meet, it seals them together, and it contains some lubricating fluid, synovial fluid. These ones are the most movable, 
They have the highest range of motion. To do that, they need to be the loosest joints as well, which is not really good for wear and tear. You don't want your joints to be too lax, but you need to have a high degree of movement. The capsule helps ensure that, and the fluid in the synovial cavity helps to lubricate the joint and keep it working properly. These joints tend to have a fairly high nervous and blood supply. So there are nerves that innervate the joints to monitor the angle of the joint and to tell when it's moving too quickly or it's too close to the end of its range of motion. And those structures are always supplied with a fresh uh, supply of blood as well. Now these are typically the most freely moving joints in the body, but they aren't completely free. They're still limited in some sense. And we'll talk about the factors that limit movement at these joints. The capsule is a big one, and the shape of the bones is second. Those are the two biggest factors, but I have a list coming up, so don't worry. Capsule is what really holds these joints together because there aren't a lot of other points of connection in these synovial joints. The more points of connection in general, the less movement you get. And so with these being freely moving, we designed them to not, be, um, to not have so many points of contact. So large range of motion, lots of movement permitted, many different kinds of movement, as we'll see shortly. The capsule limits the amount of movement, as do the, uh, the bones when they're in contact. So let's look at one example. This is a synovial joint. It's the joint between two phalanges in your finger. It's a knuckle. And I'm going to just take a frontal section Cut one half of the finger off, let it fall forward, and then I look at what's left. This is what you might see. Notice the only connections at the synovial joint are due to the capsule around the joint. The two, bo uh, the two bones will meet. I don't know what I was going to say there. The two bones do meet and articulate. You'll see the uh, cartilage, the articulating cartilage that allows smooth movement across the surfaces, but those aren't stuck together or attached. They glide. They slide back and forth and allow easy movement of the finger joint. The only way that this stays connected is because of the actions of the capsule around the outside of the joint. So the capsule on either side keeps these bones in close contact, allowing them to articulate. Without the capsule, they fall apart. If you looked at a real specimen over on the right-hand side and removed the, uh, the skin and the capsule from the anterior surface, this is what you would see. Notice the gap between them, which is where that synovial fluid, that, that lubricating fluid, would reside. These uh, surfaces are, are mated quite nicely. They share a similar shape, and they move very freely. This is probably one of the simplest examples of a synovial joint. But all synovial joints are um, some derivative of this structure. Now this is not a load-bearing joint. It's not very complicated. It's just flexion and extension. Other joints that have more complicated movements or are load-bearing or structurally important need other supporting structures. There aren't many supporting structures in the finger joints. Capsule is one, the bones together make the joint, but they don't have other supporting structures. Some of the supporting structures make sure that movement is well received at the joint. What I mean by, my, by well received is that you can do it repeatedly under stress with little wear and tear. So things like bursa will protect some of these important joints. And bursa are just pillows. These are pockets 
little pockets of that same synovial fluid, little pouches that protect structures that squish or push together. It's a sac filled with synovial fluid that cushions the movement of one body part over another. Uh, muscles over top of bone, or tendons over top of bone, or bone over top of bone. I'll show you an example in the next slide. A bursa is just a pillow that helps protect the integrity or the structure of the joint. If that bursa were to wrap around a tendon, and a tendon will specifically connect muscle to bone, if instead of one pouch you have uh, a bursa that wraps around a tendon, it's called a sheath. A tube-like bursa that wraps around the tendon. Those that always move or have a lot of tension that rub, where there's a lot of friction between structures. And so these are designed to take the brunt of the force, the brunt of the friction, to wear down first before the joint wears down. Because if the joint wears down, its structure degrades, its function degrades, it gets quite painful. You can't move around as uh, spryly as you would if you were young. Other structures that I'm not going into in depth, but that I'll show you on the next uh, slide briefly, help to keep the position of the bones oriented properly. You might have heard of a meniscus or plural menisci, or a labrum, plural labra. These are names for structures that surround um, the edges of a synovial joint and help to keep things centered in place. And I'll show you a picture again on the next slide. But accessory structures are meant to help line the joint up and protect it from wear and tear. We didn't see these in the finger joint, but we see them in more important joints like the knee. So this is a sagittal section through the knee. You can see the femur, the head of the femur, on top of the superior plate of the tibia. You can see the calf muscles at the back, the hamstrings for lack of a better word, and some of the structures that we just talked about are shown here. The knee joint is a synovial joint. It's got a capsule that surrounds these two bones. It has some other accessory structures. You can see some of the bursae, I guess, three bursas, bursae, between a tendon and the bone to help um, uh, cut down on friction and wear and tear and pressure. In front of the patella to cut down on pressure outside of the joint, and then here in front of the, uh, the tibia as well. Bursa help to cushion, and then the meniscus in this case, the lateral meniscus, you can see helping to line up the femur on top of the tibia. This you can imagine is a circle that comes all the way out of the screen at you, loops around, goes back into the screen. It's a horseshoe shape. On, uh, on this side, there's another one on the opposite side, and that just helps to make sure that the tibia lines up properly with the femur. They don't slide off. But again, a synovial joint that's largely held together by the capsule. There's a couple other structures here that help to hold it together, but we're not going in depth yet more than we have already. Now, we've covered this information already, but put, uh, to put a name to the face of the types of movement at each joint, remember I said they line up really well in order. Fibrous joints on the left generally allow no movement. They are synarthrotic. Cartilaginous joints in the middle allow some movement, cushioning and flexing between uh, vertebrae. And then synovial joints on the far right-hand side freely movable, 
the fewer points of connection and less structure you have, the more movable it is. This is one of the most freely moving joints in the body of the shoulder, and I thought about putting up a, a nice dislocated shoulder scan for you because that, that holds a personal place in my own heart, but I thought, no, it's a little eerie sometimes to think about that. I'll save that for when we get to that section in the uh, upper limb. Not a lot of points of contact between these two bones. A lot of uh, opportunity for it to slip out of place. Now, a lot of our focus will be on synovial type joints, right? Those are where things happen. That's where movement occurs. And when we talk about human kinetics, the study of human movement, we're thinking about movement, right? So the synovial joints are where we tend to focus a lot of our time. And the shape and structure of those joints allow a myriad of different types of movement. Depending on the shape of the bones that are in contact, depending on the shape of the uh, ligaments and tendons that span that joint, depending on the shape of the capsule that surrounds that joint, it allows different types of movement. The example of a shoulder, for instance, it's a freely moving ball and socket joint, the most freely moving type of synovial joint in the body. And as we add supportive structures or as we add more bones that articulate, the degrees of freedom are somewhat reduced. Some joints we know as a hinge joint. Part of the elbow is a hinge joint. The finger joint is typically a hinge joint. The knee is a hinge joint. They tend to move in one plane only through a certain number of degrees. But we have some other joints that are less well known. Things like a saddle joint. The thumb moves as a saddle joint. It allows a little bit more movement than just up and down or left and right. The wrist moves as a condyloid joint. Sliding of two flatter convex surfaces against each other. And as we look at these uh, bones in detail, as we get into those sections, you'll understand that the, the shape really limits the possible movements at these joints. Now, when I talk about movement, the words that we use to describe, a lot like the anatomical position, you know, superior, inferior, uh, lateral, medial, distal, proximal, we can use words to describe the movement at a joint so that everyone knows what we're talking about and we're all on the same page. At synovial joints, it's especially important if they're freely moving to talk about the directions of, um, or, or to understand the, the words that imply direction of movement at a joint. So flexion, Broadly, flexion, extension, abduction, adduction are the types of movements that we have at synovial joints. Flexion and extension, all various forms and all their flavors are shown here. And flexion, first and foremost, is any movement that decreases the joint angle. That's step one. So elbow flexion, it decreases the joint angle at the elbow. That's this movement. Okay, it decreases the joint angle. Where it becomes a little bit more difficult is when you can't tell exactly what's happening to the angle of the joint. Shoulder flexion. Is the angle of the shoulder decreasing when I do this movement? It's hard to tell. Where's the angle of the shoulder? So if the angle of the joint is hard to discern, flexion, forward motion indicates flexion. If it's not easy to tell that the angle is closing, but my limb is moving forward, that indicates flexion. 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 Flexion is forward. Joint angle decreases first and foremost. If it's hard to tell what the joint angle is, forward motion indicates flexion. If you have that down, then the opposite is extension. 
whenever the joint angle increases, when it opens up, extension is occurring. So from my flexed elbow, the joint angle at the elbow is increasing. I am extending the elbow joint. From a flexed position, a return to the anatomical position is extension. From a flexed position, a return to the anatomical position is extension. In most cases, that's where a joint will stop. But in some cases, you can move past the anatomical position. So if I have a flexed shoulder and I'm returning to the anatomical position, I'm extending the shoulder. If I stop at the anatomical position, my shoulder is extended, but if I keep going, it's called hyperextension. Movement past the anatomical position is hyperextension. We allow that at the shoulder. We don't allow that, hopefully, at joints like the elbow or the knee. If you do, I'm sorry for your loss. Ask Sasha about that movement, or Dr. McKenzie about that movement at the elbow when you see him in biomechanics. So flexion, extension, hyperextension, pretty straightforward when you break it down. The other movements seem daunting at first, but they're equally as easy. Abduction and adduction, shown here in their various forms. Focus on the prefix, abduction, adduction. When you add two things together, when you sum two things, you add them, adding to the midline or movement towards the midline is adduction. The example with the wrist is a nice one. I'm moving towards the midline, so adduction. If I move away from the midline, abduction. It's abducted, it's stolen, taken away. Abduction, away from the midline. Where the only monkey wrench in this understanding is the joints of the hand. When you splay your fingers apart, some are moving towards the midline, some are moving away. And so in this special case, we imagine one imaginary midline in the hand alone. So abduction, everything is moving away from the hand's midline. Adduction, it's all moving towards. That's the only special case. Otherwise, it's the midline of the body. I mean, talk about body image issues. Can you get like a doughier guy to do these demonstrations for the everyman in us? I mean, come on. Anyways, abduction, adduction, flexion, extension should be fairly straightforward, right? So we know the movements, we know the types of joints, we know how to describe the movement at those joints. Structure dictates function or structure dictates uh, movement. What are those factors that affect range of motion and movement at a synovial joint? I've listed two already, but it's important to talk about the, all the possibilities before we call it for today. First and foremost, Structure of the bones and the contact between the bones limits movement at a joint. How the bones fit together is the baseline for movement at a synovial joint. Number two, strength, tautness, or tightness of the ligaments and the capsule around that joint provide the second largest influence on range of motion. So the capsule allows some movement if there are uh, ligaments that span a joint. 
They will limit range of motion. Some only in a single direction, some all the way around, some have multiple ligaments. But the structure surrounding the joint will limit range of motion. If we take that idea and extend it a little bit, muscles that connect to or across the joint, if those are tight, those will also limit range of motion. Tightness in muscles can also help limit range of motion at the hips, shoulders, less so at the fingers, perhaps, and the elbow. So joint capsule, ligaments, tendons, muscle, other tissues, skin, fat, the accessory structures, all of those other things that might squish together as you close the joint angle can limit range of motion. They generally have a small effect, certainly smaller than the shape of the bones and the capsule itself. Now we're getting into somewhat outlandish territory, but hormones can affect joint mobility. In special cases, the hormone relaxin during pregnancy will allow a higher degree of movability at some important syntheses in the body. And another interesting idea, disuse, atrophy, the fluid, synovial fluid, that's meant to be an oil that lubricates the joints, it can become more viscous and thick if you don't use those joints regularly. The capsule can become stiffer. Muscles won't be as flexible or stretchy. All of those uh, structures that we talked about can ratchet down and limit range of motion even further. So let's leave our introduction to joints here. We're going to talk about muscle when we come back to class on Thursday. Muscle is the missing ingredient in movement at these joints. We'll understand that really well. Welcome back. Happy Tuesday. See you on Thursday morning.